Welcome to ILTV's Weekly Insider. I'm Steve Liebowitz. This week, we heard official confirmation from White House officials that a framework for an Israeli-Saudi normalization is in place. The Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman said it's moving closer every day. Prime Minister Netanyahu said Israel was at the cusp of a transformative peace agreement with Saudi Arabia. Such a peace, said Netanyahu, will go a long way toward ending the Arab-Israeli conflict and enhance the prospects of peace with the Palestinians. Well, joining us today to discuss the subject are political scientist and an expert in U.S. relations, Professor Gerald Steinberg, head of the NGO Monitor, and retired IDF Colonel Miri Eisen with experience in intelligence and a former leading advisor in the Prime Minister's office. Professor Steinberg, I'd like to start with you. Washington is now saying the framework of an agreement is in place. From what we know, what is likely in this framework? Before I answer that, I have to say from a personal perspective, looking back 50, roughly 50 years ago, I remember the Saudi ambassador to the United Nations, a gentleman by the name of Jamil Baroudi, who would take the floor, including during the Yom Kippur War in the darkest days of 1973, and denounce not just Israel, but Jews and Zionists for all sorts of evil things and how we control the press and all, for all the standard anti-Semitic slogans. And here we are 50 years later, we're talking, not just talking to Saudi Arabia through the United States, but also directly. There are, there have been now three ministers, two currently in Saudi Arabia, one was just there, three Israeli government ministers. And we're talking about a package, an agreement, which is really in, in many ways completely un not, not something that we could, unimaginable, even a few years ago. And that's tremendous. Of course, the overflights, various other things. So I think it's important to realize where we are and then talk about what the, what the dimensions are. Very quickly, I'll, what I see is the main dimensions, and roughly in the, in the order in which I think of importance. Uh, first of all, I think that it's a part of a, a Saudi package, a package of a defense framework. I'm careful to use, and we'll probably talk about this, what the different elements are, but a security framework, a solid security framework involving the United States and Israel, a regional framework, expanding on what we already have with the UAE and Bahrain and other countries. So that, that's a very important element. I think without that, the Saudis are not in the ballgame at all. Then there's the nuclear package of the Saudis one. That's very problematic. And I say this as someone who's been working on the nuclear issue for many years. That's also in some ways unimaginable and problematic. The Saudis want to have what they call a civilian nuclear program. Well, an Iranian program they call civilian. And many other nuclear programs that have come and gone are framed as civilian. Saddam Hussein called his program civilian. And then there's the Palestinian element. And the question of how much the Saudis are really serious about wanting to see major changes in Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, the Palestinian state, Jerusalem, all those other issues. So I think those are the three major dim dimensions. Each one has its own challenges. Each one has its own opportunities. All right. Well, Colonel Eisen, Washington is clearly saying that there are issues to be worked out on the Palestinian subject uh, is, is, is topping the agenda. You, uh, we just heard what could be in the agreement. What might be acceptable relating to the Palestinians on both sides? The way the Palestinians are going to see this, Steve, is going to be vastly different from us. They feel left out of the room in this agreement because in the way that Professor Steinberg just presented it, and I agree, the one, two, three of what it's about for Saudi Arabia, the military package. What it's about for Saudi Arabia, the nuclear package. What it's about that Saudi Arabia needs to pay for in that sense to be able to get both the military and the nuclear is the Palestinian issue. And the Palestinians find it very difficult to swallow the sequence of what we said. They want to be the center point. So how can they make themselves the center point and how are they going to look at this? So this isn't to differ from what we heard before, but it's to expand. Because I would add in that the third issue, the Palestinian issue, could also be called the Jerusalem issue, the Al-Quds issue the Al-Aqsa issue. I think that the big challenge when it comes both to what Israel will need to give 
And what we need to think about, and this is not going to be easy for us, is that for the Sauds, the Palestinian issue is closely entwined with the holy Muslim sites in Jerusalem that are also holy Jewish sites. That aspect there of that proximity of the holidays, of who looks over it, of the waqf, the holy trust of the Muslims, which is both Jordanian and Palestinian. I think that those are the things where Israel is going to have to reach out and find something additional. It's not about the security situation necessarily, either in Judea and Samaria or vis-a-vis Hamas and the Gaza Strip. I think that the issue is going to be about Jerusalem and what kind of an arrangement we agree to in any kind of treaty with Saudi Arabia that has to do with the Palestinians when it comes to the city, our capital, Jerusalem. Well, Professor Steinberg, have you heard any word about Jerusalem possibly being in this draft? Might Jerusalem actually be a part of the agreement? And and will there be things in this agreement that specifically relate to Judea Judea and Samaria and and the status of of the Palestinian territories? Well, I agree with Mary Eisen that the, maybe I use the term hot button issue, the issue that is is going to perhaps create the greatest amount of uh, emotion and attention is Jerusalem. But it's not clear to me that the current Saudi leadership, and particularly the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, how much he's committed to that in a religious and uh, cultural and uh, leader of the Islamic Arab world framework. I mean, they they do control Mecca and Medina. We've heard various commentators suggest that perhaps on Jerusalem, they're going to be less uh, forceful in in demanding fundamental rights and changes, particularly with the complications with the Jordanians and the Palestinians. So I leave that open. I just, there's a historical point here that I think is relevant. Well, Well, clearly the Israeli government the current Israeli government will have to make concessions. That's very clear on Palestinian issues. Whether that involves, you mentioned Judea and Samaria, whether it involves some territorial transfer, people talk about movement, some territory from area C to area B, from the area under complete Israeli control to under partly Palestinian civilian control and Israeli security control, and perhaps some from B to A, which is entirely under Palestinian control. There are different formula that are being discussed. But on Jerusalem, I think the issue is is very much one of, of religious and emotional frameworks, historical frameworks. I don't see this government, and frankly, almost any government I can imagine in Israel, making very substantial concessions on this, giving up control and all those uncertainties that may bring. Whether they're the issue of the walk, the, the uh, holy trust for the Muslims, whether that can somehow be uh, dealt with in that framework, that, that's a possibility. But people have talked about a holy basin and transferring control over the what we call the Temple Mount area, uh, including the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, to some sort of international framework where the Saudis have a foot in the door. I just can't see Not that happening. I will remind, just one, one quick point that I want to... I'll do it later. I'll add the point later. No, it's okay. Uh, Miri, I want to turn away from the Palestinians just, just for a moment and turn to your uh, expertise uh, from intelligence, from IDF intelligence. Uh, I remember over the years, one of the things that we would be adamant about was uh, avoiding the, uh, the Saudis getting the kind of advanced weapons that take away from the notion uh, of Israeli uh, qualitative uh, superiority in, in the air and, and on the battlefield in general. Is that a problematic issue if some kind of a defense agreement is reached with the United States where the Saudis get all the latest weapons and can we live with it? Where does that leave us? Yeah. We've always talked about the qualitative edge. I think, and in this sense, I think that we don't always talk about it, that already in the original Abraham Accords, in the agreements, certainly with UAE and Bahrain, we already started to rub up against the issue of the kind of weapons that are being supplied to additional countries in the Middle East that are very quality oriented, meaning we've already, I don't know if I could say that we've already passed the Rubicon on that one, but we've certainly gone a long way into understanding that we can do so up to a point. Now, you're always going to have that question, what happens if? 
But the whole idea here is that you're bringing in countries who are very challenged by Iran, by Iran's capabilities, by Iran's both self-capabilities, let alone the burgeoning relationship between Iran-Russia, Iran-China, Iran-North Korea, all of the other ones that supply terrible weapons and as they supply each other. So I think that when we're looking at Saudi capabilities, it's taking in a deep breath and understanding that both the Sauds and UAE that we like, you know, Emirates are smaller, or Bahrain, may all get weaponry, which in the past we would not have thought that we would allow a neighboring country to have. But if they're in an alliance together with the United States, together with Israel, if we are aligned together against the Iranian threat, you have to have a little real politique as you take a step forward. To Gerald's point before, the nuclear issue is a little different because nuclear has a different kind of implication. So what I'm talking about is qualitative edge in every single way on the arms, and that can be in air platforms and sea platforms in a variety of different weapons. I'm not talking about the nuclear issue. Professor Steinberg, I want to look at Congress and its relationship to the Saudis uh, moving forward. I mean, Congress, the Senate, as I understand, will have to give two-thirds approval for any deal that includes arms sales or a defense agreement between the United States and the Saudis. In the past, they have not always been fully supportive of that. Many Democrats oppose those kind of sales because of the human rights record. Do you see the, this, this uh, issue having any problem being passed in the Senate? Problem, perhaps. Uh, the Senate is controlled by the Democrats. It's a Democratic administration. President Biden wants this deal badly. So I think that if he probably can get a majority. There might be a couple of defections among the Senate Democrats. There might be a couple of Republicans, a number of Republicans who will vote for this, take an exception to the partisanship. It's a matter of, of risks and benefits. The United States also has to calculate that and look at the big picture. Uh, is this a major benefit for the United States? It certainly would be a benefit for Israel. Also, Israel has to look, we're talking about the qualitative edge, it look at risks and benefits. But I think that the question is, is this going to be a treaty? Well, if it's a treaty, and I, I really am very skeptical about that, given the nature of the politics of the United States now, a treaty would require two-thirds approval by the Senate, and I don't see that as happening. But there are other frameworks that can be developed which do not involve a treaty specifically. When I, I go back, I wrote a book a few years ago about uh, Egyptian-Israeli negotiations for the peace treaty, particularly from Begit's point of view, and using for the first time the Israeli documentation that had been uh, public, declassified, released from the archives. And there you see the meticulous internal debates that took place within Israel on each of these issues with respect to Egypt. The qualitative edge was a slightly different framework, but the peace treaty that was reached between Israel and Egypt in 1979, between Begin and Sadat, part of that was that the United States would guarantee, would be part of this process, including for the first time providing large-scale conventional arms to Egypt. We just fought a war with Egypt a few years earlier, and here it was Menachem Begin, a right-wing government, and using that phrase carefully, that said, okay, we accept that in order to have a well, peace treaty, there will be a United States well, he, Egyptian defense framework. And the same thing's true here, I think. Miri, Miri I remember uh, some years back, you and I were at the same APAC conference in Washington. Um, might we see the Israeli lobby APAC effectively becoming a lobbyist for the Saudis in order to push this deal through Congress? Depends how much in that sense. When we talk about, remember that APEC as a lobby is about U.S. interests. It's about the common U.S.-Israel interests and in bringing it together for the better the United States of America. And in that sense, a strong Saudi Arabia in the Middle East of today, a Saudi Arabia that is trying to change. For a moment, I'm not going to say that they are suddenly a liberal Western country, but there's no question that fundamental things are changing inside Saudi Arabia. I am not a person who is particularly enamored with MBS and what goes on inside there, but they're trying to change that. Now the question is, not just if, if APEC will lobby in that sense, it's a question if this is good for the United States and in that sense, the U.S.-Israel relationship. If that, as, as what Professor Steinberg said, that difference between a deal 
and a smaller agreement in that sense also has to do with this kind of lobbying. Because if we're just talking about the capability to sell them weapons that have not been sold there before, that's a smaller issue that was done before, as I said, both for the Emirates and for Bahrain in the aftermath of the Abraham Accords deal. We sold, the United States sold them weapons that they had not in the past. But for us right now, I, I'm very wary. I think that APAC had a very challenging time back in the day, again, with a Democratic president and uh, um, in that majority of a Democratic Senate um, in the House in general, um, in the Iran deal of 2015. And in that sense, I don't know if they'd want to step in to be the main um, you know, ones who were lobbying for something. It would be very clear cut what they're lobbying for, why that's good for the United States and good for the United States-Israel relationship. It wouldn't be about the sods. It would be about the benefits of that for the, the, the area in general. Gerald, I was doing some research into U.S.-Saudi relations and reading about agreements that had been in place between Washington and, and the Sauds dating back to even uh, the 1940s and then the early 50s and so on. There's a whole history and it relates to, of course, oil interests and so on. But the U.S. has never wanted to have an actual defense agreement with the United States or any other superpower. We've always talked about defending ourselves uh, wanting to, you know, only Israeli uh, soldiers will, will fight for the interests of Israel. Would it be in Israel's interest today to have a defense pact with the Saudis and the U.S.? I want to add, in answering that question, the proverbial elephant in the room, Iran. What's changed here, among, particularly for the Saudis, for the <laughs> Americans, and also for Israel, is the, the, the threat that growing threat from the Iranian regime, not just in terms of Hezbollah and terrorism and the Houthis in, in Yemen and other places, Syria, of course, but also long range, long range missiles and the developing nuclear capability. And that's a threat. It's, it's a uh, threat that to, to the Saudis as much as it is to Israel. If the United States then presents itself and there has to we have to weigh this question very carefully as the uh, country as the world leader that will protect both countries, Israel and Saudi Arabia, and also the other countries in the region that are allied with the United States. And, and the United States has a very strong security relationship with Egypt, with, the, again, the, the Gulf, the other Gulf states. It's a, it's a regional framework. And by the way, Secretary of State Blinken is coming to the region soon. He's supposed to be going to Israel and then to Saudi Arabia and then to Morocco, another element in this big picture. If the United States is considered to be a credible um, protector of the countries involved, then one can change the framework where Israel's always said, we will completely rely on ourselves. And we've done that in the past. We have a much, more, I'd say, a much more robust security cooperation relationship with the United States now we're, than 10 or 15 years ago. We're, we're almost running out of time, but I, I did want to ask uh, um, Colonel Eisen one more thing about the West Bank, about Judea and Samaria. The situation there is not so good. Let's all be honest with ourselves. Um, the, the, the security situation is not good. There's no political agreement in sight. We're, we're kind of stuck in a situation for decades since the Oslo process, certainly. Maybe this Saudi thing can shake things up and we'd come out of it with something that would be better for everyone in Judea and Samaria. Am I just, uh, you know, hallucinating here, or is that something that maybe optimistically could happen? In honor of the holiday that we're in, Sukkot, I want to be in that sense, you know, upbeat. Steve, I don't see that as being the change that would happen. I think that money makes a change, but again, money does not change the ideology. Saudi interest, Saudi money, what the Palestinians probably need more than anything else and I hate saying it, and I don't mean to be derogatory, is attention, TLC, and money, meaning they want to be the main issue. And so in that sense, if the Sauds would project this as being something that's all about the Palestinians, and it's something to help them be the center of attention, and it's something that will bring them money, that's a good thing. Having said all of that, I need to remind us all that Saudi Arabia has been meeting the leaders of Hamas, 
Saudi Arabia, Arabia in that sense is not, you know, against Hamas and for Fatah, so that in that, um, the, the area itself, the challenges of the domestic arena of the Palestinians will not be resolved by an Israeli-Saudi Just, just one, what, we're just about done, but just a final note about that. Gerald, were you surprised at all by just how little resistance the Palestinians have put up until now, meaning they seem to be willing to go along with it under certain conditions or if the price is high enough? The Palestinians now are in a massive leadership crisis, even worse than Israel's. Basically, they've had two leaders. They've had Arafat until 2004 when he died, and then Mahmoud Abbas. And I'm saying this quickly. There's a lot more to be said about this. They don't really have political leadership. They have a great deal of trouble articulating what their interests and policies should be. And I think until Abbas has gone from the scene and somebody else establishes him or herself, likely him, as the head of the Palestinian Authority, able to make policies coherently and to follow through on them, I think the Palestinians are very much going to be reactive. And that's probably not good for Israel, because it will not, even if they do get large amounts of money and even get some attention in TLC, as, as Mayor Eisen said, I think it's going to be a lot more complicated. I think this is being done over the heads of the Palestinians, just as Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin, a point I was going to make earlier, Sadat talked a lot about Palestinian rights and also talked about Jerusalem, but when it came down to signing a peace treaty, they were very, very marginalized. Miri, final word for you as we are about to go off the air. Um, I know it, you don't want to look towards next Sukkot already, but if we're sitting in our sukkahs next year, <laughs> could it be just as easily in Saudi Arabia? I want to hope so, and I really do believe it is a possibility. All right. Well, I, I want to thank both of our guests, uh, Colonel Miri Eisen and Professor Gerald Steinberg. I'm Steve Leibowitz. This was ILTV's Insider. For more of the latest updates from Israel, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. Thanks for watching and shalom from Israel.